given the opportunity to have a, a farewell on Saturday, June the 2nd uh, against the USA. I notice um, Glenn Whelan is also mm. uh, included. Is there any clarity on his intentions? Mm, not or? especially, no. I mean, O'Neill basically said he hadn't really spoken to him. Mm. Um, and uh, so... It's no time. Uh, Whelan, that's about six, seven <laughs> yeah. months. So Whelan's given no indication that he's planning to retire, but I guess there was a... He might have been working under the assumption that he was going to phase him out. Um, but he's named them there in the long list. Uh, now Villa are in the playoffs, so I mean the decision might be taken out of his hands to a point. But yeah, I mean it, you would have thought there was a natural break time just you know for all concern. Mm. But Whedon's saying obviously he's taken the view, but he's not going to contact him and tell him he's gone. And O'Neill hasn't really spoken to him, so it's a bit of a strange one. I mean, someone like Stephen Ward, for example, um, he's just out because he's got a little uh, knee issue that he hasn't had a proper rest in a couple of years, basically. That, you know, to allow him to facilitate it, but Whelan, Whelan is on that list. Um, I wonder, is it a case that, I, I know John, um, Martin O'Neill, after the Euros, asked for John O'Shea to stay on in a sort of a kind of father figure role yeah. around the squad, that maybe Martin feels that if Glenn is willing to stay on, that there are a lot of new names and, and not necessarily young faces, but inexperienced faces that will be coming in and out of the squad and he could do with somebody who knows the ropes. It's possible, but he, he had that discussion with John Walters and they came to the conclusion he would stay on and, okay, I think he still sees him playing, but that he would do that. I mean, they haven't had that discussion at all. Now, I'm not sure if they've ever had a you know a fantastic relationship, uh, O'Neill and Whelan, maybe okay. relative to, to other players in the squad uh, and and is, is this a factor in it in some way that they haven't necessarily been you know been speaking you know like buzzing buddies they obviously had a relationship with O'Shea going back to Sunderland and so on um, so I'm not sure if that's entirely on the on the agenda here but I guess in, in a strange way the ball's in Whelan's court and we'll see um, if he feels there's any announcement to make because I mean he is going to be what 36 I think maybe in 2020 like does he want to stay yeah. on um, and be dropped you know get you know yeah. after and, and things going well for him at, at Villa and oh, he's doing well I mean there. Yeah. he's had a very good career you know it's just uh, maybe not going to get the send off that someone like O'Shea might yeah um, Whelan still around O'Shea as you say Dan is gone or certainly will be shortly 116 caps for Ireland great career uh, five Premier League titles for Manchester United a Champions League title will we see his likes again in a green jersey for Ireland a player of that pedigree um, Kevin did get a chance to speak uh, to John earlier today and here's what he had to say. Now I don't think it went unnoticed yesterday that our third most decorated um, international footballer with 117 caps, hopefully soon to be 118 caps, retired yesterday. He's actually our fifth most decorated uh, player in, at uh, international level as well. I'm delighted to say that I've got on the line John O'Shea. John, how are you keeping? All right, Kev. How are we doing? Yeah, I'm very good. I'm very good. Uh, John, big decision yesterday uh, from you to, I suppose, was it, was, it, was it the case of finally announcing your international retirement? How did you come about to make your decision? Yeah, exactly, Kev. Um, just, I'd, I'd spoken to Martin previously, obviously, uh, well, obviously with the, the game against, the games against Denmark in particular, and uh, the games, obviously, he kind of was, he, he was probably aware, that, and we were both aware, like, obviously I wasn't going to be going on for the next campaign. And the ideal scenario was obviously to to get to Russia and to make the squad for Russia. Um, that was the, the, would have been the, obviously the, the, the plan if everything had uh, gone okay. And, uh, but once that was out of the way, and then obviously um, I was wanting to just get the season out of the way, and then, I'd met Martin uh, and spoke to him, spoken to him a couple of times, and uh, he had said to me, "Look, what about uh, what about we go for the the a game against the be captain for the last game at home against the USA?" And uh, yeah, I thought look, it'd be be a, be a nice way to to finish things up, you know. Was it was it in your mind, John, after the the Denmark game that that was it? Obviously, you're saying that you wanted to finish ideally with a World Cup, but was was the Denmark game that's uh, that, that's it? You just maybe wanted to concentrate then on on club form after after the back of that. Then was that was that just in your mindset? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And kind of well, obviously through the campaign uh, when I'd spoken to Martin after the Euros initially, because it was probably on my mind, thinking because obviously I played uh, so much, and then thinking about Martin, obviously. We spoke about. It. He said, "No, look, you'll still be, you're still being involved." And I've, obviously, I played in a few of the games, but um, obviously, look, there comes a time, Kev. It, it, you have to let the the younger boys kick in mm. and step up to the plate. And uh, that obviously, you, 
they use your experience and help around the squad and that. And um, but obviously that was coming to a point where look the the boys were doing fantastically well at club level as well as international level. They were stepping up to it, so it was in good hands to take over. Yeah, I mean you made your international debut now, John, in August two thousand and one. You know, seventeen years as, as an international footballer. It's, it's still not an easy decision to make. So what then finally then swung it then for you? What 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 was in your mindset when you decided, look, that is it? Because it's been such a huge part of your life, both underage and senior international football. Yeah, that was the thing, and obviously. Um, it's just the, the, the commitment as well that's needed uh, to fully to fully go with it. Um, making sure, obviously, I still I'm hoping to play, say, for another year club level. Um, I played say plenty of football this year, but uh, a, a case of to have that commitment. We have uh, baby baby number three, fingers crossed, on the way soon enough too. So <laughs> all, all them. You got your hands full. <laughs> um, but uh, I thought, especially look, obviously, you, I'm not getting any younger too. So mm. uh, if I had been still playing in the team, fair enough. But um, no, there was comes a time where yeah, I've had a, I've, I've had a look. I've been so fortunate to have an amazing run at doing something that I dreamt of as a kid. So uh, to, to have a chance like that was was amazing for me. Yeah, I said to you, I said before, the fifth most decorated Irish footballer, you've won 14 trophies, five Premier League titles, a Champions League, John. Can you, can you put into words the, the high points and the low points? Can, can, you, can you reflect now across the course of your career and think of the high points and, and the low points that you had during your, ter- during your time playing? Ah, well, look, there's, the, the, I've been fortunate yeah, as a sense that you, there's been, as you say, Kevin, plenty of high points, but there's been obviously the low points as well, and they're the things that kind of to drive you on to still to still want to be uh, playing at the level that I say that I kind of played at. Um, in the sense of mi- missing out on the World Cup, obviously would be uh, would be a bit of a sickness. But look, I've been blessed to, to to get to major tournaments with Ireland. There's been many uh, fantastic players that maybe haven't got to a major tournament, you know, or different things like that with Ireland. So, um, but missing out on the World Cup will definitely be a uh, Definitely be like a disappointment, but it's 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 small in, in significance if you know what I mean. In the yeah. sense of the the, the the things that I have enjoyed uh, throughout my career, you know. But um, I've like, obviously spoken to yourself and other players that have been to these occasions at a World Cup. It's uh, it's obviously something that you, you get great memories from, you know. So that that would definitely be up there, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly um, the. the the, the highs and the lows, mm. Kev, it, at, at this minute, because everything is just kind of rushing through your head of, uh, mm. say, what's going on, especially at international level, you know, but um, it, 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 there's been highs and lows, that's for sure. Well, I think we'll, everyone will remember your goal against Germany in Gelsenkirchen on your 100th cap. That, that surely has got to be, be right up there with some of the best moments. Yeah, look, if you, you couldn't have scripted that better, especially... Um, the significance from it in terms of the way the qualification was going to, to make it count, to, to be away from home, practically the last kick of the game against the world champions, you know, that was, that was, uh, that was, that was a great night, you know, and uh, it's definitely one that's, it's definitely close to the top, if not at the top, Kev, that's for sure. Yeah, and I, well, another thing is, well, you, you, you wrote an open letter, John, uh, and you obviously met, you tried to mention, or you did mention everyone across the course of your career, ranging from uh, people who would help you in, in the early stage of your career. You mentioned Brian Kerr and Noel O'Reilly when you'd won the European Under-16 under uh, tournament as well over 20 years ago now. It, 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 do, do all these fl- uh, come flooding back to you as well? How, and, and the one thing I want to say as well is how difficult was it maybe to pen that letter given that there's, there's so much support that you would have had across the course of your career? Did, was, that, was it kind of nice when you were trying to reminisce about everything that, that you were writing about within that letter? Yeah, it was, but it was also difficult in the sense you're trying uh, to keep to minimise it as, as much as possible type of thing. I didn't want to uh, go into into too many kind of things or forget things or leave people out or whatever. But I just um, just the significance of of that for me in my career, I think, uh, was huge at the time when we won the European Championships under 16 because more than likely I was going to um, I was going to sign for Celtic. Uh, straight away probably after that tournament but then that's when Manchester United saw me play 
um, up at that tournament in Scotland. So uh, it's that was the kind of a, a huge catalyst for me to, to obviously to go to, to Manchester United from that point and obviously to, to have the career that I had. So um, that was a it was a big point, and I thought I had to obviously get that in because it obviously was twenty years the anniversary of it mm. as well, was just after happening too. So and obviously we'd had a bit of a reunion earlier on in the year and. Uh, it was it was great to catch up with everyone, and obviously the, the sad part was obviously missing missing Liam Miller from it, you know. Yeah, I, 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 again, I mean, how, how difficult was that for, for you, John, with Liam? Because Liam, obviously, I, I would have played alongside him a, a number of times. Um, it, it was kind of well, it was incredibly sad uh, d- down at the at the funeral down in court when when I went down as well. But th- how difficult was it for you to to come to terms with that after after Liam did pass away uh, most recently? Yeah, it was. It was difficult at the time, but yeah, yeah, that's the thing where you have to. Everyone, unfortunately, sometimes in life, these things I sort of cherish the, cherish the good moments that we have, and these things happen in uh, mm. that it, it happens in life, whether it be uh, personal, families, or obviously colleagues that are friends and stuff like that. And obviously, growing up with, through the Irish teams with Liam, and uh, then when he came to join United as well for a spell, and. Um, it's obviously just the, the scenario, but we're, the memories obviously I have a Liam too are very special, and I'm sure his kids and his wife Claire going forward they'll have they'll have amazing memories to to remember him by too. You know for what a fantastic fella he was, but also an amazing player he was too. So they'll have lots of great memories to live. Yeah. and remember him by that's for sure yeah of course uh, John I, I just wanted to touch on John just before, before you do go you said that you want to carry on playing what do you see yourself do now over the next few years given you know it's been a, a really difficult couple of years for you now uh, at club level but you said you want to carry on playing do you still feel fit enough strong enough how, how long do you think you can actually go on for yeah just just about Kev um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm no, buying your corner mate don't worry about that no look it's, it, it's one of them things uh, when I signed, obviously the the last couple of years of Sunderland have not gone to plan for for the club, and for that for other players, obviously as well, everyone involved in it, um, and that's been hugely frustrating because you know yourself, Kev, what a what a fantastic club it is, and um, fingers crossed they just get things sorted as quickly as possible with the new owners, new manager, and an idea in place because. We show that that stage is during the season, but not enough. That obviously the, we could get results, but it was just uh, the backup of the, the backlog of all the say injuries, signings, changing the managers, all them things have, have caught up with the club the last couple of seasons, and it's been on a, a terrible spiral down. So mm. the sooner, the sooner the better. The the owner get the uh, makes the decision, or it gets cleared by the. By the EFL and the the new owner can put things in place with the with the management and whatever. So, and, sorry, uh, John. What, me, John what, what, yeah, what is your just contract the, situation at the moment, John? Sorry, just yeah, just wait and see. Just yeah. wait and see. Cause obviously, I mean, I was contracting uh, end of June, uh, and it's just a wait and see. But look, when I signed the contract last season with Sunderland, I kind of thought, well, we see we see how the body copes. If obviously you're wanting to play as much as you can and compete and be competitive, but I probably played more than I maybe I thought. Um, during the season but that was a, obviously a good thing too that my fitness was able to hold up and get through the game so um, look we wait and see wait and see Kev yeah just one, one last one last question then John sorry on the international um, team themselves where do you see the team now now you, you're walking away from it you've, you've, you've covered so many different eras and so many different managers where do you see the team now what position do you, do you see them in going forward yeah it's tricky it's a tricky one um, Kev but they They've got a good nucleus now that I think are um, are playing at a, obviously in the Premier League. When you look at obviously Seamus, Shane Duffy, uh, Kev uh, Kev Long has been getting in now as well. Yeah. Uh, Clarkey's obviously played plenty of Premier League. You have Wardy, um, then you have Jeff James McCarthy when he comes back. Um, you have Long. There's a good nucleus of boys that are from from the Premier League. And it's it, it, it's going to be tricky because there's a balance of uh, young Declan Rice coming through, the, 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 not to be putting too much expect, expectancy on maybe some of the younger boys that have maybe just had a little taste. Of, but we we definitely need more 
the, the manager is going to need more help from from maybe uh, lads that are so going to be surprise packages and they're going to have to maybe have that bit of patience. But it's it's, it's going to be a tricky time. But they've got uh, a manager in charge who will who will get the most from from the players he's got. That's for sure. He'll and he'll to to come so close to qualifying. As as we did in the, in the, the last campaign for the World Cup, there was was a, a fantastic achievement, you know, and it, it it could have been so close, obviously, in in the sense of the playoff game, it it just obviously went went wrong, and basically forty five minutes of football rather than a whole campaign, you know what I mean? So that's that's the, the positive that we have to take from how close we got to in that sense. Oh, John, thanks very much for your time. John, you will make your 118th and, and final cap uh, in on June 2nd, it is, at the Aviva against the United States. So I wish you all the very best with that one and good luck to you for the, for the rest of your career. And also, John, when you're in Dublin next time, you're going to have to come in, you're going to have to spend a bit of time in the studio with me and one of the lads here one night and we'll, we'll do a good sit-down with you anyway. OK, look forward to it, Kev. Good man, thanks, thanks very, very much. much Th thanks for your time, John. Good man, Kevin, getting that sewn up there. Yes, John O'Shea calling time on his international career yesterday after 117 uh, caps, a glorious career um, with Ireland. And uh, he will get a chance, as Kevin said, to say farewell to the Irish fans at that uh, friendly against the USA on June the 2nd. You would have dealt with him in terms of media on and off through pretty much all his, his Ireland career, Dan. He always struck me as a complete class act. Oh yeah, and I mean, he, there was times during his career where he would have been at Manchester United, obviously, and I think when he came over and did sort of media stuff, you know, he'd be getting questions about sort of, uh, I don't know, Alex Ferguson or Roy Keane or mm. Wayne Rooney or whatever it might be, and he probably had to learn his diplomatic skills pretty quickly, and, um, you know, he, he, he mastered that, but sort of you always sense, you know, it's... it's type of thing people always say at these times but I certainly never heard too many people speaking bad words about him you know I don't recall any major conflicts or stuff that he was ever involved in you know yeah. and um, I suppose he sort of straddled two generations in a way that he, he came the tail end of that O2 team and, and that group and maybe there was a lot of responsibility on him in his early Ireland days Mm. To, to be a star when he was still finding his way maybe in terms of being a senior player in the team and I think probably the second half of his Ireland career it probably was better maybe in terms of his Irish performances um, in that you know he got to get some major tournaments and finally got to sort of lead the team and, and be a central figure whereas he probably was shifted around a bit in his younger Irish days sort of in tandem with where he was Yeah, victim of his, well. his versatility Big time, in, in both yeah. Because he, he, he was a he was a defender, but not. Um, by the way, we are slightly distracted here. There's a bit of once. a skirmish involving Paul Pogba and Andy Carroll here, which has resulted in Pogba being booked. And Mark Noble. Mark Noble involved was involved. Well. There's a real, yeah, a real confrontation there going on. Bit of a Rami <laughs> certainly livened, livened up. Yeah, the game. sort of given. Uh, I think it's given people sort of probably doing reports in this game something to something. talk about because uh, it, it's spilled over and it's still continuing here. Sort of, it's been sort of two and a half minutes going on here. So um, yeah. yeah. Um, I grow on the pitch uh, at the London grow. Stadium. Thankfully, no fans involved. Uh, no, they're too, they're too far away to get involved, <laughs> I think. Um, just coming back to John O'Shea there, uh, you know, that, that sense of versatility. Um, he, he was a defender, but he, he couldn't be the sort of old-fashioned centre-half people wanted to be. He could play a bit. Um, he got shunted to left-back under Trapattoni as well. It was sort of, you know, that sort of sense that... Yeah. You know, a lot was expected of him. Yeah, and like, he never really played any position for a sustained period of time probably other than centre half his last couple of years like I think back to uh, you know missed a chance for Ireland in Paris or under mm. Kerr in 04 I can't think actually what position he played in that game he was like left back under Staunton for a while then right back under Trapp and went off injured in the Henri game in, in Paris which is sort of forgotten he went off in the second half and I think he was he was missed and um, yeah just a, a lot of sort of near misses probably in his earlier Ireland career and it's good that later on you know he got to be involved in you know the German Germany game, yeah. his, his 100th cap and the equaliser, but also the Germany game at home, got to lead the team out at the Euros in France, and probably a happier time, you know, um, and he was right, probably a victim of his versatility, and probably, you know, Richard Dunn was around at the same time, and he was maybe yeah. the commanding centre half, and so O'Shea maybe didn't, you know, get to play that position the whole time, and in fairness, he wasn't necessarily playing it for his club either, you know, um, at that point. But I still think, you know, a sort of a hundred and seventeen caps, couple of major tournaments, and and as we touched on earlier, you know, it was someone will be appreciating his hindsight how good his career was. Mm. Great stuff, Dan. Right, taking a quick break now. Back uh, after this break with Chris Hutton. 
Football on Off The Ball. Brought to you by the Boyle Sports app. Cash out and in-play betting available in the App Store and Google Play Store. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. With Jess Kelly. Coming up this Sunday, we continue our series on how technology is transforming the health service, this time looking at how data is providing invaluable insights into epilepsy. We'll take a closer look at what Google got up to this week, from banning ads to bringing smarter AI into our lives. And of course, we'll answer your tech questions. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. With Jess Kelly. This Sunday at 6. On News Talk. Best thing about May? It's summer, but you can enjoy it because the kids are still in school. It's warmer, even if there's no actual sunshine. And the amazing sale is on at AppliancesDeliver.ie with up to 25% off washing machines and dishwashers, up to 60% off cooking appliances, and up to 25% off fridges and freezers. There's even up to 20% off garden and DIY, because you never know, there could be two sunny days in a row. Living the dream. The May sale now on at appliancesdelivered.ie. Why pay more? My dad was a Jack Russell. Loved chasing cars. Me, I prefer being in them. The whole family out, windows down, wind in my hair. Lick a bit of ice cream off the back seat. Any flavour? Any car. You see, we have AA car insurance, so we're covered to drive any car. Well, they are. I don't drive, obviously. (laughs) Though I do have a licence. With AA car insurance, our members get fully comprehensive insurance to drive other cars too. Go to the AA.ie and get €100 off today. Who's got clever car insurance? Excludes value product. €100 discount available until the 31st of May 2018. Minimum premium of €280. Acceptance criteria, terms and conditions apply. AA Ireland Limited Trading as AA Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Some jobs need a master. A mortgage master. With dedication, focus and expertise. If you need results, you need someone with decades of know-how. With no distractions, no time-wasting and no faffing around. Not a jack of all trades, but the master of one. For a job as important as your mortgage, that's EBS, the Mortgage Masters. Search EBS Mortgage Masters to find out more. Lending criteria, terms and conditions will apply. EBS DAC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Smart just got smarter at Carphone Warehouse. The brand new Samsung Galaxy S9 with incredible 12 megapixel camera, super sharp display and much more is now only 99 euro. That's a Carphone Warehouse exclusive. Something else in mind? Our huge range of the latest smartphones means you're sure to find the model to suit your lifestyle. Save up to 200 euro when you switch to Vodafone at Carphone Warehouse. Hurry, offers only available while stocks last. Your choice, any network, any phone, any plan. Only Carphone Warehouse. T's and C's apply. Off the ball. This is News Talk. You're listening to the football show on Off the Ball. Now, from one former Republic of Ireland defender to another, uh, where John O'Shea is heading off into the sunset international wise. Uh, anyway, Chris Hutton is the man of the moment, the flavour of the month in managerial terms, anyway, after keeping Brighton uh, in the Premier League, uh, after getting promoted last season, after over. Uh, what 30 odd years uh, outside the top flight they will be in the Premier League uh, next season Chris Hutton uh, attracting all sorts of plaudits for the job that he's done there uh, Kev and myself managed to catch up with Chris a little earlier on and I started by asking him whether given that Brighton had a game last night have they had a chance yet to celebrate or process the achievement of staying in the top, in the top flight um, uh, probably not because um, we, we were one of the teams that uh, had a game in hand, so of course the, the fact that we played last night, it was very quickly on to sort of the preparations for uh, for last night. But I, but I think it did sink in. You know, I think we were you know, probably in a in a in a better position than, than some of the others around us because you know we had the points, and, and of course what we've what we've now learnt is is at, at thirty seven points, you know that would have been enough anyway. So. I think our situation was perhaps a, a, a little bit different, and I and I and I can understand certainly the the joy that some teams have um, uh, have, have found and, and experienced in sort of rec- recent days. But, um, but uh, wonderful achievement from everybody at the club, and yeah, yes, it, it has sunk in, and uh, uh, but we are very much looking forward to the season finishing. In in some of the comments from yourself from the players, one of the teams is is realising how hard it would be and how hard it was to actually stay in the division. Can you maybe put into or describe those challenges? What was what was so difficult and what hit you last uh, August, September when you got into the Premier League and, and took on what, what, was, uh, what was in store for you? Yeah, well, I think it was, 
Well, I think it's it's. Um, I think if you start and you you know you win, you know your first couple of games or get a result in the first couple of games, then I think that gives you that lift from the start. But that you know that wasn't the case with us. You know we had to wait a few games to get um, to get our points. I think what helped was is that our level of performance in the first few games wasn't bad. So it wasn't as if we uh, went into the division and and found that we couldn't um, step up to the level. So I think we was confident that way. But until you get them first points and that first win on on the board, then, you know, there's that little bit of apprehension that can set in. So fortunately for us, it was it was early enough. And, and what we have been able to do is be, we've been able to have, you know, reasonably sort of consistent periods in the season. And, you know, apart from two games at home, Liverpool at home and Chelsea at home, where we lost 4-0 and 5-1, you know, the score lines have been reasonably close in most of our games. So I think it was that first win that, uh, that I think gave us the encouragement that we can get results. Chris, you came on onto the show last year about this time just after you secured promotion and you'd spoke about the fact is you, you, you want to stick to the principles. Obviously, you want to try and add a bit of quality to the squad going forward. Is was that always the mindset of you? Stick to, to what's got you to the position that you, that you were in at, that, at this stage last season and then try to kick on taking the team forward. Was that always in your mindset? Yeah, it, it was always the mindset, but you know, we know how that can change. And mm. you know, If you go into the season and you're going you know, five, six, seven games, as some teams have done, uh, you know, without getting results, you know, you're, you're very conscious that you might you know, have to change things, change your formation or so, but... But I, I, I wanted to play the same. I mean, in the, in the, in the, the championship, we, we played sort of predominantly 4-4-2, 4-4-1-ish. One, uh, I knew it was very difficult to play 4-4-2 in, in the Premier League, so I wanted to go into the season very much 4-4-1-1, which would give us still you know, an attacking threat. Wide players um, being you know, winger-type players that can work both ways and, and see you know, how far that could take us. And as I say, probably... You know, it took to our first win and then, you know, a series of decent results to, you know, to enable me to really to stick with that. But what we did do, I think, amongst the, the formation we wanted to play, I think we added some, some quality to that. You know, predominantly sort of through the middle in Davy Proper and probably Pascal Gross, you know, right, right through the middle. And, of course, the goalkeeper, Matty Ryan. Yeah, no, that, 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 I, mean, I was going to ask you about Pascal Gross as well, and of course, you know, with, with Shane Duffy, the way that he's developed. But one, one player that I, I, I saw recently, or I heard recently, was Lewis Dunk. He, he was talking on, uh, it was actually on Five Live, I think I heard him talking. He was talking about the, the challenges that he, he met coming into the Premier League, talking about the fact is that, yes, you, you're going to be coming up against some world-class strikers, but outside the top six, he felt as though watching Premier League football and even when he maybe the reality hit him he was playing Premier League football that he feels as though yeah we can actually get results against these sides if we stick to what we've done getting get promoted pretty much what I said before we can actually beat some of the sides around us so it was actually quite fascinating hearing the players talking about that so it was again was that was that the message that you were trying to give off to the players that it isn't as daunting as maybe it might seem mm. well I, th I think there's two things there's one you know the, the constant messages that you have and and, and, you know, we go into every game, you know, looking to get a result, you know, wherever that is, home and away. And, and I said, we don't change too much. Occasionally we might go to a 4 3 3, but don't change too much. But I think this, it's probably more, you know, from what the players saw. And where Lewis is right is, you know, and, and I'm not taking anything away no, from. No, it, it, it wasn't actually talking the way it was arrogance. It was, it was a reality. It's, it, 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 it just the confidence grew as each and every game went through. That, that was what it come across to me. It wasn't an arrogance in any way. Oh, no, no. And, and uh, no, that, that I believe, what I, mean, what I was going to say, is that I think what, it, what he found is, he, is exactly what we saw, where um, you've got the top six that uh, are very entrenched as the top six. But I think what we found this season is, is that if we looked at, you know, your, your Burnleys and your Evertons and your Leicesters as that next group of teams that are vying to get into that into that um, the top six, you know, they were teams that you felt, um, you know, almost came into a bigger group of teams that can win and lose games. And uh, I think they think that's what exactly what Lewis is saying and what, what he saw. And... Um, uh, and that's a good thing. I think if you've got your own players 
that are seeing that and feeling that that they can get results against what you regard as the you know the seventh and the eighth and the ninth and the tenth uh, best teams, then uh, you know that you hope that that confidence that they can take in the games. As a club, Chris, you've been uh, praised for the recruitment that that you, you just mentioned there with, with Kevin and and your comments after the United game, talking about the de- different departments at the club recruitment board level. We'll start now planning for next year. How big a part of the success at Brighton has been the way you guys are structured? And I say this in mind, of, bearing in mind other clubs that are, are sacking managers and making changes. And, and I'm just wondering about the, the overall direction of the club. How important is it to have that going in the right place and, and everybody pulling in, in the one direction? Mm, well, what, what, what generally this club has had is a, is a level of uh, stability, whether a chairman that's very ambitious, that has that uh, we have a new stadium, um, some, I think, six six seasons now. We have a training facility that's now four years old. And um, a, a chairman, as I said, that's very, very ambitious. But, you know, what we've had is, is that amongst, and how you can have it in football, which is very, very difficult, you know, amongst the, them sort of levels, we have had a fair amount of stability. And, and um, of course, as a manager, it's some three and a half years uh, that I've been in now, and, and probably in in our modern era, you know that it seems strange that, that you know I would be one of the longer serving ones, you know. Um, but we have a, a structure at the club. We we work very hard with our recruitment department. I, I think a good part of our success over these last few seasons has been, I think, the way that we've recruited, you know, each in each window, and I think we've improved in each window. And it's and it's such an important aspect of, of, of our game, and you know, and and we are very aware that a player can do well at, at one club and not do well at another, and you have to bring him into an environment where he can improve. But you know, it's such an important part of our game, and and I think has been a strength of ours over recent seasons. Are the days of the the, the big dictator figure, the the Wenger or the, or the Ferguson, running everything at a club over, Chris? Um, yes, it is, um, and, and I think it's pr- probably over also because you know managers don't want that type of responsibility and power. What they want to be able to do is dictate how their team play, the players that come in, uh, making sure that you can structure your team well, and and the pressure that, that are on results. And um, you know, as regards the, the, certainly the old days of managers doing contracts and running other aspects of the club. It's 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 an area really that, that that managers these days you know don't want to get into and and I think it helps you know we, it, it's such a, a difficult job now and there's so much pressure on it you what you want to be able to do is be able to concentrate on the the real things that matters and that's it, and that's about getting football results. Uh, Chris, I, d- I just wanted to ask you about my my last point, I suppose, about Shane Duffy. Shane Duffy now has just become um, Ireland Player of the Year. He had a he's had a brilliant uh, campaign across the course of the, of the World Cup qualifications f- for us f- from a, from an international point of view. How good is he, and how good can he become? Because we've put a almost because he, he's still relatively inexperienced at international level. But we've put a lot of pressure on him now because he's going to be probably going to be our main defender, our main player now over the next five to ten years. So how good can he be? Um, well, certainly, uh, probably for us, you know, at, at, at Brighton, if you, know, if, you were to, if you were to say that, that he would maintain, you know, his level, you know, he's been with us now for two years. If you said he was to maintain his, his level, for, uh, what he's shown over these two years, you know, we would be delighted with that because it, it, he has been excellent for us. I mean, what, what he has also been able to do is go through these these two seasons with us uh, almost without injury. So he's played um, played in almost every game. He's built up a, a great relationship with um, with um, uh, Lewis Dunk, uh, and I suppose probably that's something that he's you know going to have to do at in, international level because of of the course of the the changes changes there. Um, but there's, there is more in him. He's a, he's a if anything, you know, mature, immature for a centre half, and when I say that, I don't mean as, as regards a person, because he's a very uh, a mature lad for us. But but if we're looking at uh, a centre half playing at his peak, you know, I always feel that um, the the best age for a centre half is is getting towards his late twenties, late twenties, and and sometimes even early thirties. So. 
yes, I still think there's um, the development and, and growth in him and maturity in him, um, but he's been outstanding for us. Just on a final point, Chris, um, I'm reluctant to, to make every interview that you do go towards the area of um, the prominence or lack thereof of black coaches in the game, but you have been um, a, an impassioned and outspoken um, advocate for, for that particular issue. When you are achieving this sort of success, and bearing in mind the continuing um, small number of black coaches in English football, um, and the adoption of things like the Rooney Rule um, for, the, for the Football League and the, and the FA, is it anywhere in your mind when you're working in, in the Premier League and do you feel that you're representing black coaches or, or is it a, at the back of your mind? Uh, no, it's, it's um, something that, that, that I carry with me and I'm, I'm very happy and um, proud uh, to carry that with me and, and in any way you know, if I can be you know, um, uh, inspirational or any type of role model to um, those um, young um, black and ethnic coaches that want a career in the game, um, that is something that I'm very, very happy to, to take on. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we can make strides. I think the, there is that enthusiasm, I think, for, for it to happen to redress that, that balance. And, you know, even as regards, uh, we've seen of late that, that after this World Cup that, that, that there will be a black and ethnic coach going with with all of the uh, underage uh, England sides, and I think senior sides as well. So, so I, I, I'm hoping that we can make progress. Certainly, there's been good progress in the amount of black and ethnic coaches at, at grassroots and and uh, academy under 23 level, and it's just trying to readdress that balance at senior level and very much in the forefront of it. Well, Chris, we wish you continued uh, success and thanks for your time today. Uh, by the way, Manager of the Year nominees, Pep Guardiola, Jurgen Klopp, Rafa Benitez, Roy Hodgson, Sean Dyche and yourself. Ah, Esteemed company well indeed. Well, man, Chris. <laughs> uh, uh, a very, very good company there. And I, I shan't tell you this moment who my vote would be for. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Chris. Thanks for your time thanks, today. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, you're very welcome. Very welcome. And Chris was on his way to the uh, LMA Awards, which uh, I believe are happening uh, this evening uh, when he spoke to us. Um, talked about John O'Shea being a class act. He is a complete class act in every way, isn't he? Yeah, it's a good hour, I suppose, in terms of like two uh, hugely sort of respected figures. And yeah, the managed, he sort of managed to endure, you know, the... Like, you know, football can be an unpleasant business sometimes mm. and you always assume that you have to have some kind of pretty management to have some kind of nasty, nasty streak almost to prevail in it but uh, you know Hewton's managed it and he is an advertisement you know he touched on it sort of for stability and you know Brighton have made this huge step after 30 years and how do you stay there and in some ways like a club like Stoke was being held up as a template and yet look at, look at the mistakes that they've made um, and, and strangely Burnley and, and Brighton have come up and stuck with managers and, and you would hope they're getting the rewards still going to be difficult for them second season next year mm. but um, you feel with him there there's going to be a calmness around the place that it's not going to it's not going to sort of lose the run of itself as a club it's it's funny and you know th that was the word that he went for stability like I, I know a manager would say that oh I'm, I'm all for stability because yeah. it means keeping in, in the job but if you look behind the scenes there and it's, you know as soon as the final whistle went and he was he was in doing his interviews after the game he was talking about well now the recru recruitment department can get get going and you know it's it just p uh, paints the picture of a club where he's coaching there's a recruitment department um, there's you know there's there's people going doing their jobs and it's it's working well for them and if all that works well then you know the coach can go and do his job. It's functional and I suppose I mean he sets a good example from the top. It must be said. I mean you speak to people, players, someone like Richie Towell is now out on loan, but by all accounts the facilities at Brighton are amazing. The detail, the training ground. They're starting to attract good young players because they're becoming a. We think of Brighton in, in lower league terms, but mm. they're a proper Premier League club now. And what they needed was the front of house to match it and I mean he is a good figurehead for it but it is definitely a club now that seems to have everything all the ingredients there to push on um, and you would hope that they don't get notions you know and, and expect yeah. too much too soon but I think everything as you said it seems to work it's a functioning place and you hope that they've been rewarded for that and will continue to be whereas other clubs that are chopping and changing managers as we see uh, they're the ones that have been in a bit of bother this year. Mm. And obviously, they, they had the whole issue with the stadium for, for, for decades. They were sort of a nomadic sort no, of they've had a, they've lost done, club, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, I think the guy involved with Brighton now is a, like a racehorse owner, and they, they, there's yeah. a few colourful characters involved, but yes, they've, they've spent well. they spent wisely, and 
yeah, I think I think there's a fair chance that they're to stay. Yeah, and it's great to see Chris Hewton doing such a great job and being recognised uh, by it uh, as well. Uh, Dan, thanks for joining us on the show uh, this evening. Uh, just to let you know, to celebrate the release of the new Liverpool home kit, which is coming out tomorrow, we're giving you and a mate the chance to meet Liverpool and Republic of Ireland legend Jason McAteer this Saturday in the Liverpool FC store from 10am in Dublin's ILAC Shopping Centre. Places are limited. So make sure you register for tickets to avoid any disappointment. You can get them now at offtheball.com forward slash events. It has, by the way, finished nil-nil at the London Stadium, scoreless between West Ham and Manchester United. That's Manchester United wrapping up second place in the Premier League table. We'll be back after this quick break. Off the ball on News Talk. <laughs> Athlete of healthcare, where for the toughest jumps and bumps in life, even lashing yourself into the sea. That's why we record these ads with me. Well, here, in the water, the absolute freezing cold water. See, Athlete of healthcare, we're for living, and we want you to embrace what it truly means to feel alive. It's good to live. Find out how at LeahHealthcare.ie. Leah Healthcare, looking after you, always. Leia Healthcare Limited training as Leia Healthcare and Leia Life is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. It's time for summer at Dunn Stores with our Better Value 6. A choice of six fresh fruit and veg for only 49 cents each. Plus delicious Dunn Stores strip loin steak. Three pack now just 9 99 And save again with our 10 euro off every 50 euro grocery voucher. Dunn Stores, always better value. Terms and conditions apply. See in store for details. Minimum spend required. That's the sound of all the money that Mary has saved since she bought the Siemens Avant-Garde washing machine. Thanks to its IDOS feature that automatically measures the detergent for you, helping you save water and detergent. Not only was the washing machine delivered and installed using one of Harvey Norman's great installation packages, but her old washing machine was taken away free of charge. Visit Harvey Norman today, in store or online. Go! Eastern Philosophy from FBD Hotels. Go east and relax in our Castle Knock Hotel, a nudge from the bright lights of Dublin. Refresh in our spa before cocktails in our Lime Tree Bar. Or go southeast and recharge at Faith Leg, our majestic estate in Waterford. Find golf, a splash in the pool, or afternoon tea in our Aylward Lounge. Whatever you're looking for, find something you weren't. Like great value four-star deals at castleknockhotel.com or at faithleg.com. Off the ball. This is is News Talk. Okay, just time to tell you that tonight's mystery voice was, of course, Brian Cody. And congratulations to Chris Hearn, who's won a pair of tickets for the game between Leinster and Munster on the 19th of May. The prize includes pre match hospitality and an overnight stay in the Ballsbridge Hotel. It's all thanks to uh, Bank of Ireland and the Irish Heart Foundation. Now, tomorrow morning, OTB AM is live at 7 45. Get onto youtube.com forward slash off the ball, facebook.com forward slash off the ball, or follow the show on Twitter. And you'll be able to watch a documentary uh, about uh, Robbie Henshaw that Off The Ball are showing for the first time tomorrow morning. All about his life away from rugby and his love of music. Unusual one. That'd be well worth a watch. Uh, and then uh, we're back tomorrow evening at 7pm with Brian O'Driscoll and a ladies Gaelic football special. The uh, Off The Bench gang will be uh, taking uh, over the show. Tom Dunn is up next. Dan is still here. Uh, Dan, you've a uh, Friday off. You're not going to see Rovers, but Graham Burke in the squad. Will that change your mind? Will you? Ah, uh, no. I, I have a night off, so I'm going to take it. But uh, <laughs> hopefully now Graham Burke's presence, uh, you know, might get a few people along, extra people along to watch that game. It's Rovers Waterford. Actually, should it's be a big good. game. Yeah, good match in Tala Waterford are going very well. Both sides actually played good football, and that that actually has allowed Burke to shine. I think at times mm. that the slightly improved standard of play or tactical style of play. Um, you'll get a good game if you go to Tallis certainly tomorrow but I won't be there <laughs> <laughs> oh, never mind. so there you go well listen Dan thanks for taking me through the show holding my hand so to speak metaphorically there. speaking uh, anyway throughout uh, the evening Tom Dunn is up next uh, we'll chat to you tomorrow on the show good luck give him a ball and he had a grass he'll give you a move for the perfect pass